The Ministry of Secondary Education has developed a distance learning platform for students of secondary education in Cameroon. A series of lessons taught by qualified teachers for secondary school students. Under the stewardship of Professor Pauline Nalovalyonga, in collaboration with the Ministry of Posts and Telecommunications, CAMTEL, CRTV and UNESCO. We are introducing distance learning as another teaching and learning method which is different from the traditional classroom setting that you are all used to. In the distance education mode, you are not with the teacher in person, so take your time, relax, listen to the teacher, take down notes and visit the following links for any questions or answers to your questions. Take it in your stride. This is Cameroon's solution to COVID-19 and beyond. Professor Nalova Lyunga, Minister of Secondary Education. Welcome to this revision session for ordinary level economics. My name is Tapi Godwin, your form five economics teacher. And specifically, we'll be revising economics form five. This revision program is divided into three phases. Phase one is the economy and finance. This phase is composed of two topics. The first topic, money and banking. And then the second topic is public finance. Phase two is titled the national economy and external trade. This phase equally has two topics, international trade and national income. And then phase three is economic growth and managing the economy. Phase three has five topics. First, there is economic growth and development, agriculture and industrialization, state intervention in the economy, economic fluctuations, and we run off the phase with full employment and unemployment. But first, we'll look at the structure of the GCE ordinary level paper. This paper, or ordinary level economics, has two papers. We have paper one, which has a duration of one hour 30 minutes, and paper two, a duration of two hours 30 minutes. Paper one has 50 multiple choice questions drawn from all the topics subject syllabus. This paper has 40% of the total marks for ordinary level economics. Actually, the objective of paper one is to test the ability of students or learners, candidates, to recall and apply basic principles of economics Paper 2 has 8 essay type questions, but candidates are expected to answer any 5 of the questions. Given that the time allocated for this paper is 2 hours 30 minutes, it means that you have about 30 minutes to spend on each question, or perhaps 25 minutes if we have to consider the fact that we use maybe five minutes to read each question. The weight of paper two is 60% of the total marks. That means that each question will be 20 marks. That is the five questions that makes 100, but you will be converted to 60. The objective of this paper is to test the ability candidates 
to explain economic concepts and apply them in resolving basic problems. We now go to the first phase of the vision project, and specifically money and banking. You recall that money is any asset, any item that is generally accepted in exchange for goods and services and in settling debts. And that money actually helps to solve the problems faced in the battle economy, the most significant of which is the problem of double coincidence of wants. Generally, money has basic characteristics or qualities. Here we are talking about the qualities of good money. First, good money must be generally accepted. The general acceptability makes it a legal tender. It should be durable, capable of being used over a long period of time during which its value will not deteriorate physically, seriously. Money should be portable, that's another significant characteristic. Capability of being carried around, even in large amounts, easy. Good money should be divisible. That means that it should be able of being uh, split, divided into smaller denominations to enable small-scale transactions to be possible. Good money should be homogeneous. Units of each uh, amount, units of each unit of the currency should be the same. That would mean that a 500 francs held by somebody in point A should be the same as the 500 francs held by some other person in point B or in town B. Money should be scarce. And finally, money should be cognizable, meaning that we should be able to recognize it as money and distinguish it from perhaps counterfeit. We move to the functions of money. Money has four main functions, you will recall. First, it functions as a medium of exchange. Secondly, a measure of value or units of account. Thirdly, a store of value. And finally, a standard for deferred payments. When money functions as a medium of exchange, it means that through the use of money, we can exchange one good for another or a service for another. When money functions as a measure of value or unit of account, then it means that we use it as a means of quoting prices, making economic calculations. When money functions as a store of value, then it means that we can keep assets that are not needed immediately in the form of money until when they are needed in future. And when money functions as a standard of deferred payment, it means that we can use money as a means of selling goods on credit so that uh, payments can be made on the future date using money. The motives for the demand for money, recall that the demand for money is the desire to hold wealth in liquid cash. So why would people desire to hold wealth in liquid cash? We call that the demand for money or liquidity preference. So there are three main reasons for liquidity preference. First, we have transactions motive, holding money as a convenience to make everyday payments, like for buying food, fuel, bills, and so on. Another motive for holding money is for precaution. We call that precautionary motive. This is when money is held 
as a convenience to guard against unforeseen circumstances. And finally, we demand money for speculative motive. Speculative motive is when we hold money because we want to make a capital gain from changes in the price of securities or if you like financial assets. Components of the supply of money. You will also recall that the supply of money is the total amount of money that is circulating in the economy at a particular time. Or better still, the stock of all liquid assets that performs the functions of money, either partially or entirely. So look at the components of the supply of money. Of course, we have cash, we have uh, the cash in circulation with members of the general public, we have current account deposits, and then we have near money, near money, any item that can easily be converted into cash without a significant loss of value. So broadly, the components of money supply are classified into narrow money and broad money. Narrow money is that part of money supply that used directly as a medium of exchange. That's where cash in circulation remember members of the general public comes in. And they will have current account deposits. That money that is kept by people in their current account can use that directly as a medium of exchange. When we make purchases or payments using a check or an electronic visa card. So that is narrow money. Broad money is money supply in general, which is composed of narrow money and near monies like uh, time deposits, like certificates of uh, deposits, uh, treasury bills, bills of exchange, and so on. So they fall under the category of broad money. Even uh, foreign currency, because foreign currency is really not a legal tender, but it can easily be converted into a local uh, currency, and that makes it uh, near money. We look at changes in the value of money. But what is the value of money? It is the actual quantity of goods and services that a given amount of money can purchase. The value of money varies inversely with price level. When the price level of goods and services is rising, the value of money is falling. And when the price level is falling, the value of money is rising. That's what we mean by the value of money varying inversely with average price level. And of course, the value of money is measured using the retail price index. The retail price index is used to measure the value of money. The retail price index is simply an average price which is calculated to show how the value of money has changed over time. It is calculated by taking the sum of all weighted price indices and dividing it by the sum of the weights. When the value of money changes, it is as a result of changes in the average price level. So when the average price level is rising, it means that the value of money is falling. And that rise in the average price level is actually known as inflation. Thus, inflation, by definition, is a persistent increase 
in the average price level of goods and services in the economy, or a persistent increase in the general price level. When, the, when there is a persistent fall in the value of money, it means that there is inflation in the economy. So inflation can also be seen as a persistent fall in the value of money. Because when the price level is rising, it will mean that a given amount of money can only purchase fewer goods. For the types of inflation, inflation generally is caused by demand pull factors and cost push factors, giving rise to what is known as demand pull inflation and cost push inflation. What exactly is demand pull inflation? This is the type of inflation that results from demand persistently rising over supply of goods and services. In other words, demand pull inflation is a persistent increase in price level caused by excess aggregate demand over supply. When demand is rising and the amount of goods produced in the economy remains the same, or perhaps it's falling, or it's rising at a relatively lower rate, then price level will be uh, pulled upwards. We call that demand pool inflation. The other type of inflation, cost push inflation, is when the average price level is rising because of increases in the cost of production. You will recall that cost of production are the expenditures incurred in producing a good or a service. So when the expenditures incurred in producing a good or a service is rising, when the cost of production is rising, then firms will normally increase the price of the goods that they produce in order to hold on to profits or to prevent or avoid making losses. So by definition, cost push inflation is the persistent increase in the general price level caused by an increase in the cost of production of goods and services. If we want to look at the general causes of demand pull inflation, then we'll look at those factors that will make demand to rise, that will basically lead to uh, a rise in price level. First, we have government budget deficit. Remember, a budget deficit exists. So of course, when government spends more than its tax revenue, so when there is a budget deficit, then you mean that more money will be pumped into the economy. And if output does not increase accordingly, then price level will rise. Another cause of demand pull inflation is increase in money supply. Perhaps if the government increases money supply, probably through uh, an expansionary monetary policy, then price level will increase, especially in the short run, if output does not significantly increase to accommodate that increase in money supply. We also have export surplus. Export surplus, of course, when we export more than we import, so much so that the amount that is remaining for domestic consumption is not sufficient to meet domestic demand. In that case, we earn so much money from export, but that money will chase fewer goods at home causing price level to rise. War is another factor that may cause uh, demand pool inflation. Hello? 
Belum. Yes, ya, Allah, is how can we uh, define expo, expo surplus? I just said that expo surplus, of course, when we export more than we import, such that the amount of goods that is remaining after export is not sufficient to meet domestic demand. In that case, we'll have much money from export, but the money will chase fewer goods, causing price level to rise. That is how export surplus will cause demand through inflation. Another factor that will result or that will cause demand pull inflation are the wars. When there is a war, resources will certainly be diverted towards the production of arms, and uh, that will mean that the production of consumer goods will fall. And so demand for the consumer goods will not exceed supply, causing price level to rise. And finally, increase in consumer spending. When there is a consumer optimism, when consumers increase expenditure, when output of goods and services has not increased, then clearly you will be like too much money chasing fewer goods, causing price level to rise. Of course, demand pull inflation is that kind of inflation that results from too much money chasing fewer goods. How can demand pull inflation be eliminated? Because of course, you come to realize that inflation has lots of uh, negative consequences. And so it becomes necessary for the government to resolve or to eliminate demand pull inflation. First, we have contractionary fiscal policy. That basically is a budget deficit. Government spending less than its tax revenue. And then second measure to eliminate demand pull inflation will be contractionary monetary policy. Remember, monetary policy are policies aimed at reducing the supply of money. Contractionary monetary policy will be like increasing the minimum lending rate, increasing the cash ratio of banks, uh, uh, selling securities in the open market. So all these will reduce money supply, thereby preventing people from being able to pay high prices. So that reduces demand for inflation. We also have physical policy or direct control measures that can be used to reduce demand pool inflation. Here we are referring to maximum price control and wage freeze. Maximum price control when governments impose prices on goods and services which are less than the equilibrium price. So that will mean that producers, even if they want to, will be prevented by law from selling goods above that price. So that also will drop demand pool inflation. Wage freezing is banning any increase in wages by firms. So all these will reduce demand pool inflation. We're not turning to cost push inflation. The causes of cost push inflation. Remember we said cost push inflation is that type of inflation that comes from an increase in the cost of production. And so any factor that will cause the cost of production Good to increase or goods and services in general to increase would be a factor that will cause cost push inflation. In particular, we are talking about wage increases by trade unions because sometimes trade unions will put pressure on firms to increase their wages. So if the firms increase wages, uh, then it means that their cost of production has increased. And sometimes to compensate for this increase in cost they tend to raise prices of their goods. And then another factor that may cause cost push inflation is the increase in indirect taxes. Indirect tax are taxes that are imposed on goods and services. So when indirect taxes increase, it means cost of production has also increased. So firms want to compensate for this rise in indirect taxes by increasing the price of their goods, leading to cost push inflation. And then we have increase in input prices as another factor that may lead to cost push inflation. Uh, the price of inputs here, here we are talking about 
of raw materials, when the price of raw materials increase, then firms will also increase the price of their goods in order to compensate for that increase in price. And this leads to uh, cost push inflation. For example, if the price of plants increase, then we expect the price of furniture to also increase. Uh, the fourth factor that may generate cost push inflation is increase in interest rate. Interest rate, of course, is the price of capital. So when interest rate increases, it means cost of capital has increased. And as a consequence, firms using those capital goods will also increase uh, uh, their prices in order to compensate for that increase in the rate of interest, and this will lead to cost push inflation. Uh, finally, we have currency devaluation. Uh, a currency devaluation occurs when the government deliberately reduces the value of its currency in terms of other currencies. This essentially will make import prices to be high in terms of the domestic currency and of course export prices to be low in terms of the foreign currency and when import prices increase then cost of production increases especially if we depend on imported raw materials so that of course generates cost push inflation and as a means of reducing cost push inflation, measures that government can use to reduce cost push inflation would be to discourage trade union activities. Because we say sometimes the cost push inflation will be increased by, uh, by, by it may be caused by increase in wages. So if the cost of cost push inflation is increase in wages caused by trade union pressure on firms then it may just be necessary for the government to discourage the activities of the trade unions, perhaps uh, banning the existence of closed shop unions. So that way, uh, they may not be able to put so much pressure on uh, companies or firms to raise wages that will increase cost of production. And then, if there is a minimum wage legislation, number a minimum wage is usually set above the deep living wage rate, and that also makes cost of production to rise. So, if the government can abolish or cancel the minimum wage law, then that may just make the wage rates to go down to its competitive level, causing cost push inflation to drop. And then we equally have price control. This price control is mostly on uh, raw materials. Okay, the government could impose a maximum price on certain raw materials, uh, maximum price on maybe rent, or maximum price on perhaps uh, any good that may increase cost of production. Then that, of course, will reduce the cost push inflation. Uh, the food method that the government can use to eliminate cost push inflation, maybe to grant subsidies to firms, because when the government subsidizes firms, then that will reduce the cost of production, making them to increase the output of goods that they produce, and as a consequence, price level will drop. And finally, to reduce indirect taxes. If the government will reduce indirect taxes, then Clearly, uh, cost of production will reduce, and that will reduce cost push inflation. The direct opposite of inflation is deflation. If deflation is a direct opposite of inflation, then it means that it is a persistent fall in the average price level. So inflation persistent increase in average price level of goods and services, deflation, persistent decrease in the average price level of goods and services. And of course, when there is a deflation in the economy, a 
it means that the value of money is rising. Deflation may be caused by a number of factors. First, we have high rates of unemployment. When unemployment in an economy is high, then it means that people may not earn much income. People will be losing their source of income. And as a consequence, their ability to pay high prices of goods would be punctured. That would lead to a fall in demand, and that fall in demand would cause price level to go down. So one of uh, one significant cause of deflation is high rate of unemployment. But we also have low income levels. In an economy where income level is low, we also expect prices to drop because the demand for goods and services in such an economy will also reduce. And economic theory tells us that when demand falls, price level goes down. Uh, we have import surplus as a source of uh, deflation, a cause of deflation. When there is import surplus, then it means that the supply of goods in the economy will increase. And economic theory equally tells us that when the supply increases, price level goes down. Uh, equally, when the government increase subsidies to firms, this will also or may also lead to deflation because the subsidies will reduce their cost of production. And as their cost of production reduces, they are able to increase supply. And that increase in supply will pull down prices of goods and services, leading to deflation. And finally, we have decline in consumer confidence. Uh, when consumer confidence reduces, it simply means that they have some kind of a pessimistic view about the future, possibly uh, with the hope or rather the expectation of a fall in income levels or high levels of unemployment in the future. That would make them to cut back on their purchases. That would cause them to reduce their demand for goods and services and possibly rather increasing savings in order to save for rainy days. So this fall in the demand for goods and services will also lead to deflation in the economy as price level is falling. But uh, why are we not happy when there is deflation in the economy? Well, obviously, we want price level to go down because a falling price level means that the value of our uh, money that we have increases. So why is deflation uh, bad for an economy when it actually means fall in price level? When a price level falls, perhaps uh, you may want to go for uh, more food than you used to consume or you want to grab uh, another television and all those things. First. When there is deflation, the profit of firms reduces. So if you are a producer, you suddenly know when price levels fall because uh, that fall in price level will mean that your profit margin may reduce. And uh, deflation also has the ability to increase unemployment in the economy. So actually unemployment increases because producers may want to cut uh, their costs by laying off workers. As the price level of goods and services is falling, it means that the ability of firms to make profit will reduce, as mentioned uh, earlier. And when profit margin of firms is reducing, the firms now want to look for measures to cut their costs of production to reduce expenditures in producing these goods. And one of those measures could just be to lay off some of the workers that way uh, we see that the fall in price level actually creates the negative effect of uh, raising unemployment in the economy. And equally, a fall in the average price level, otherwise known as deflation, may also lead to fall in economic growth since it discourages investors 
you want to invest in a business where you hope the expectation of making profits are really up there. But when price level is going down, uh, reducing the ability to make profits, then it discourages firms from investing. And when they don't invest, it means that the output of goods and services produced in the economy will reduce, and that uh, is a fall in the rate of economic growth. Remember, economic growth is the increase in a country's productive capacity uh, identified by a sustained increase in the gross national product or national income. And when there is growth, then it means that uh, more jobs will be created. When there is growth, it means that standard of living will improve. But fall in price level actually prevents the economy from growing, and that reduces the standard of living in the economy. So how then can the government prevent deflation or reduce deflation? First, the government may increase its expenditure, increase in government expenditure. This increase in government expenditure, possibly through a budget uh, deficit, would increase the demand for goods and services. And when demand for goods and services increase, price level uh, may rather increase, so that will prevent deflation. And then if the government reduces taxes, direct taxes, a reduction in direct taxes, would increase disposable income. One of the causes of deflation is low income level. So by reducing direct taxes, disposable incomes will increase. And that increase in disposable incomes will increase the demand for goods and services, causing price level to go up or preventing deflation or a fall in the average price level. Wage increases can also be encouraged as a means of uh, reducing uh, deflation. So this increase in wages will also increase aggregate demand. When your wage rate increases, you want to buy more goods and services, and that will increase price level. Remember, when demand increases, price level goes up. And uh, finally, the government will relax credit control policies, allow firms to be able to sell on credit, when firms are able to sell on credit, then demand will increase. The view is maintained that people tend to buy more if they are able to pay little. So relaxing credit control policies will certainly increase demand, and that will cause price levels to rise, or that will reduce uh, demand, or rather will reduce uh, deflation in the economy. Okay, we now uh, focus or move uh, focus our attention on uh, commercial banks. What exactly is a commercial bank? A profit-making financial institution whose business is to accept deposits of cash from members of the general public for safekeeping and even to use the deposits to grant loans. So by definition, a commercial bank is a or commercial banks are profit-making financial institutions that trade in money by accepting deposits and granting loans. Uh, we have lots and lots of commercial banks in Cameroon. The Apriland First Bank is an example of a commercial bank. The Eco Bank is an example of a commercial bank. The SEC, International Bank of Cameroon for Savings and Loans. Uh, United Bank for Africa, and lots and lots of them. Take note, the Central Bank is a Central Bank. It's not a commercial bank. We could talk of development banks like the Petit Foncier de Cameroon. We could talk of the Cooperative Bank, like the Union Bank, Cameroon and so on, but uh, there are different types of banks, so we should be very careful not to uh, take one to mean the other. Commercial banks have three main functions, you can call them primary functions. First, they accept deposits, 
These deposits are accepted in the current account or in the saving account, deposit account, or in the fixed deposit account. So banks do accept deposit as a major function for safekeeping. Another significant function is that the grant loans or the give out loans. The loans could be term loans or advances. They could grant loans by uh, giving over drafts and even by discounting bills, in bank discounting bill, uh, when it buys a security at less than the face value of that security. So by buying the security at less than the face value, it means that the bank has given a loan which of course will mature or which will pay back when the security matures. And the difference between the discount, the discounted value of the loan and the value of the loan upon maturity is the interest that the bank makes for discounting that bill. And then the third main function of commercial banks is that they act as agents of payment. Commercial banks make payments on behalf of their customers. They pay civil servants on behalf of the government. So when they are paying civil servants on behalf of the government, they are acting as an agent of payment. When they accept a check, they are acting as an agent of payment. Because that check is an instruction by a customer to the bank to make payment to a certain person whose name is on that check. They act as agents of payment when they honor standing orders and so on. So these are the primary functions, the basic functions of banks. But we also have other functions which are like secondary or agency functions like uh, buying and selling foreign currencies acting as trustees and executors of customers wills and estates uh, acting as consultants and so on so the main function accept deposits give out loans and act as agents of payment we'll look at credit creation of banks this is uh, a section that students usually run into trouble what exactly is credit creation? The ability of banks to increase that part of money supply that is known as bank deposits. The world said bank money supply is made up of cash in circulation with members of the general public and then bank deposits, which could be current account deposits fixed term deposits for which a certificate of deposit is issued and so on. So when the bank is creating credit, it means that it is making the kind of money known as bank deposit. And banks create credit in three ways. First, when they accept a deposit. So a bank creates credit when a person makes a deposit in that bank or when the bank accepts deposit. Because when the bank accepts deposit, money supply, the bank deposits increase by the amount deposited. Secondly, a bank creates credit when it buys a security with a check drawn on itself. Because the bank now issues a check and then use the check now to buy that security. It means that it's drawing that check on itself. And finally, a bank creates credit when it gives out a loan, when the bank grants a loan. Uh, this, of course, is the method that is most often demonstrated to show credit creation. Uh, when the bank grants a loan, it creates an account in the name of the customer in which the amount that the customer is borrowing is deposited in that account 
and from which the customer can withdraw the money using a check. So by creating that account and depositing the money in that account, bank deposits increase. The central bank. The central bank, as I mentioned earlier, is very different from the commercial bank. It is sometimes referred to as government bank. It is the financial institution that controls the entire banking system. The central bank is that financial institution, that bank, which is charged with the responsibility of supervising the entire banking system and controlling, implementing government monetary policy. The Central Bank of Cameroon is known as BIAC. And BIAC, which is uh, the abbreviation for Bank of Central African States, is a central bank for Cameroon, but also for all the other countries that make up the SEMAC region. And recall that there is only one central bank in a country. The case of Cameroon is a bit different because we have a central bank that happens to be the central bank of the other five countries of SEMAC. Remember, we also have the European Central Bank. The functions of the central bank. First, we said, or rather, first, it controls the supply of money in the economy. And the control of the supply of money is technically known as monetary policy. So the central bank is that institution that controls the supply of money. That is the main function. Secondly, it issues notes and coins. That means that the central bank has the function of printing bank notes, of minting coins that circulate in the economy. No other institution has that responsibility except the central bank. Thirdly, the central bank functions as a lender of last resort. A lender of last resort. This means that it is the responsibility of the central bank to grant loans to commercial banks in the event where they are unable to meet up with the obligation of uh, paying back uh, or meeting the demand of customers who come to withdraw money from the account. That is the lender of last resort. So if commercial banks are in difficulty, then they will always turn to the central bank as a last resort for loans. And so it's a function of the central bank to do that, to grant that loan. But it also functions as a banker's bank. Banker's bank means it is a bank to commercial banks. Just as commercial banks function as bankers to the customer, so too the central bank function as bankers to commercial banks, meaning that they accept deposits from commercial banks, grant loans to commercial banks. So, and finally, the central bank function as manager of the national debt. So it manages the national debt. Remember, the national debt is the accumulated total of all unpaid borrowings of the central government. So as manager of national debt, it means that they service the national debt. Servicing the national debt means paying interest on all the money that government is owing. And they repay the national debt itself when it matures. So these are the functions of the central bank, main functions control of money supply, issue of notes and coins, lender of last resort, banker's bank, manages the national debt, banker to the government, because the central bank also functions as banker to the government, which means that it keeps government reserves. 
But we did say one of the main functions of the central bank is that it, uh, it controls monetary policy. And that monetary policy is the control of the supply of money by the central bank or by the government. But what are the instruments that the government use to control the supply of money? We call that monetary policy instruments or instruments of monetary policy. First, we have open market operation, which is the policy of buying and selling government securities in the money market, in the capital market. We have uh, the use of special deposits, where if you want money supply to increase, then you release special deposits to commercial banks. And if you want money supply to reduce, then you will increase or call for more special deposits from banks. Uh, another policy or instrument that the government can use to control the supply of money is funding. Funding is uh, increasing the average maturity period of government debts. So when the government increases average maturity period by incurring only long-term loans or by converting loans that are nearing maturity to long-term loans, then we see it's engaged in funding, and this policy actually reduces the supply of money in the economy. And then the use of bank rates, bank rates, also known as the minimum lending rate, which is the interest rate that the central bank will charge on loans that it has to grant to commercial banks. So by increasing the bank rate, it reduces money supply, and by reducing the bank rate, it increases money supply. And then we have a credit control policy. Uh, here, uh, we are talking of uh, Treasury Directive, Treasury Directive, which could be quantitative, qualitative, giving specific instructions to commercial banks to limit credit to a particular amount within a certain period, or to be biased in granting credit. Perhaps giving loans only to certain sectors of the economy and not to other sectors of the economy. That way, the government uh, can influence economic activities. And finally, the government can use moral suasion, which is a specific uh, kind of uh, treasury directive where the central bank appeals to commercial banks to follow a particular credit. Uh, policy. Okay, based on this uh, summary, I know we have touched on some concepts but not all as far as money and banking is concerned. But we'll stop and we'll take, we'll look at these few questions. Uh, first, the multiple choice questions. I'll read the questions carefully then we'll attend a solution to them. First question. Which function of money solves the better problem of double coincidence of wants? Which function of money solves the better problem of double coincidence of wants? A, we have store of value. B, we have unit of account. C, medium of exchange and D, standard for deferred payment. C. Correct. C, medium of exchange. You will recall that double coincidence of wants is a difficulty of uh, finding someone who has what you want and wants what you have. So with money, coming as a medium of exchange, that problem no longer exists because we simply use money to buy what we want. And so we must not necessarily move around to look for someone who has what we want and the person wanting what we have. Fine, next question. What type of money does notes and coins represent? What type of money does notes and coins represent uh, A, token money, B, representative money, C, fiduciary issue, and Z, 
commodity money. So these options, they, they kind of show the stages in the development of money. You know, money developed from commodity money to representative money, also known as commodity back money, and then to token money. So what type of money does notes and coins represent? Please. I have no idea, sir. Okay. That would be token money. So A, correct answer there is A, token money. Remember, token money is money not convertible into gold but accepted as a medium of exchange because of the government decree. Representative money is uh, uh, representative money uh, receipts issued by goldsmiths which were accepted as money because they were convertible into gold which has an intrinsic value. And of course, commodity money were goods and services that were used as money. So, the notes and the coins that we have today are token money. We accept them because the government has guaranteed that it will be exchange for goods and services. Question number three. Which of the following is not a quality of good money? Which of the following is not a quality of good money? A. <laughs> Which of the following is not a quality of good money? What did you say? C. C. Abundance. Of course, of course, that is correct. Abundance. We'll look at qualities of good money, which we mentioned earlier. Should be portable, portability. Capable of being carried around easily, even in large quantities. It should be divisible. Being divided into smaller uh, denomination to facilitate transactions of uh, small value and then general acceptability of course that is the essential condition for any item to accept it as money so money should not be in abundance it should rather be scarce that does not mean that uh, we cannot work hard to get much money question number four which of the following is used to measure changes in the value of money which of the following is used to measure changes in the value of money? A, money index. B, value index. C, weighted index. D, retail price index. D. Fine. That is good. Retail price index. We say retail price index is an average price which is calculated to show how the value of money change over time. Next question. What relationship exists between inflation and the value of money? What relationship exists between inflation and the value of money? I'll read the options and then you give me the answer. A, inverse relationship. B, direct relationship. C, no relationship. Z, direct and indirect relationship. What would that be? Share it. Any idea? A. Very good. A, inverse relationship. That inverse relationship means that when the rate of inflation is rising, it means that the value of money is so inverse is like moving in opposite direction. Question six. If in one year the price index is 104 and a year later the price index has risen to 112, what would be the annual rate of inflation? If in one year the price index is 104, use your calculators, please. 
And a year later, a year later, the price index has risen to 112. What will be the annual rate of inflation? A, we have 8%. B, we have 2%. C, we have 0.08%. That would rather be 0.8%. And D, we have 7.7%. So you read C as 0.8%. So what would be the rate? Of inflation. Any idea? Oh, Sherry. Okay, to get the rate of inflation, we take the current year price index, the current year price index, over the base year price index, and then we multiply that by 100. So that will give us the average which of course represents the rate of inflation. So the inflation rate there would be the current year in uh, price index, which of course would be the price index of a year later, 112 over the base year price index, which is that price index of year one, which is 104, and then we'll try to buy. 100. This will give us 107.7. Uh, and of course, this 107.7 means that the increase in the average price level is 7.7%. That will give us the inflation rate in the economy. So, correct answer there is D, 7.7%, the annual rate. Of inflation. Okay, take the next question. If the rate of inflation falls from 12% in 2021 to 7% in 2022, then it means if the rate of inflation falls from 12% in 2021 to 7% in 2022, then it means A, prices were rising at a slower rate. B, prices were falling at a slower rate. C, prices were falling at a faster rate. And D, there is a 5% fall in average price level. This is tricky. If the rate of inflation falls from 12% in 2021 to 7% in 2022, then it means A, prices were rising at a slower rate, B, prices were falling at a slower rate, C, prices were falling at a faster rate, and D, there is a 5% fall in average price level. The correct answer there is A, Prices were rising at a slower rate. Remember, when the rate of inflation falls from 12%, it means that it was a 12% rise in the average price level in 2021. But in 2022, there is a 7% rise in the average price level. So price level is instead rising. But this time, it is rising at a slower rate. So you may be tempted to take a fall in the price level. No, it is a rise in the price level, but that rise in price level is at a slower rate. Question eight, which of the following accounts of commercial banks permit money to be withdrawn by check? Which of the following accounts of commercial banks permit money to be withdrawn by check? A, we have site deposit account. B, time deposit account. C, fixed deposit account. And D, the savings account. Which of the following accounts of commercial banks permits money to be withdrawn by check? 
A, site deposit account, B, time deposit account, C, fixed deposit account, and D, the saving account. The correct answer there is E. The correct answer there is, uh, sorry, is uh, A, site deposit account. Remember, the site deposit account is also known as the current account. This account allows a customer to withdraw his money on demand, uh, meaning that he can withdraw the money at any time through a check or an electronic visa card. But of course, the bank will charge the customer uh, when he keeps money in that account. Question 9. A banking system, a banking system balance sheet shows the following item. The banking system's balance sheet shows the following items. We have cash, 5 million francs, money at call, 10 million francs, deposits, 40 million francs, we read 40 million francs, and advances, 25 million francs. The cash ratio of this bank is A, 6.25%, B, 12.5%, C, 37.5%, and D, 18.75%. Recall that cash ratio is the percentage of total deposit that the bank must keep as cash so as to be able to meet any demand for cash by depositors, whether expected or unexpected. And so cash ratio is calculated using the formula cash amount over total assets, or if you like total liabilities, times 100 over 1. Remember, the bank's balance sheet, assets must be equal to liabilities. So, Cash ratio is calculated R, and cash ratio is calculated using the formula cash, the total amount of cash, divided by total assets times 100 over 1. Oh, look at it. The value of cash in this economy is 5 million francs. 5 million francs. And then the value of total assets. Look at it carefully. Cash is an asset. Money at call is an asset, which is 10 million francs. Uh, money at call are basically loans to discount houses. Loans given on the basis that they can be recalled at any time or within a short notification. So that's 10 million francs. Deposits is not an asset. Deposits are liabilities, so they don't fall within our uh, solution set. And then advances, 25 million francs, so that is an, uh, an asset. Advances are illiquid assets. So we take cash, 5 million, money are called 10 million, that is 15 million francs, and uh, advances, 25 million, that makes 40 million francs. So total assets, 40 million francs. We multiply that fraction by 100 over 1. So that will give us uh, that will give us 12.5 percent. So as a solution, the value of cash 5 million, the value of total assets 40 million, cash ratio, cash amount of total assets than 100 over 1 which is 5 million over 40 million, 1.8 times 100, that gives 12.5. So the correct answer there is B. So a bank that has those assets, as stated with those amount, will essentially have a cash ratio of 12.5%. Question 10. To discount a bill means to, to discount a bill means to A, Sell it when it has declined in value. 
B. Sell it at constant rate. C. Read C, please. C. Purchase it at more than its value on maturity. And D. Purchase it for less than its value on maturity. So you read the way the letters are. A, B, not A again, C, and then uh, Z. So correct answer is uh, uh, correct answer is D. To discount a bill means to purchase that bill for less than its face value. So when a security is purchased at less than its face value, we say the security is purchased at a discount. But when it is purchased at more than its face value, then it is purchased at a premium. Exercise 11. This now is a paper two type question. A. States and explain why people prefer to hold part of their assets in liquid form. States and explain why people prefer to hold part of their assets in liquid form. B. Explain two causes of one, demand pull inflation, and two, cost push inflation. C. State four problems faced by commercial banks in your country. State four problems faced by commercial banks in your country. So solution, A, why people may prefer to hold cash. The reasons for the demand for money. First, we have transaction. So people prefer to hold cash, liquid cash, rather than in any other form as a convenience to finance daily purchases like payment of bills, like purchase of food, and so on. Secondly, for precaution, this of course is as a convenience to uh, guard against unforeseen contingencies like payment of hospital bills, uh, when sick, uh, or when involved in an accident, or any other form of emergency. And finally, speculation, to make a capital gain from changes in the price of securities, like buying a financial asset in anticipation of any higher interest rates. B, the causes of demand for inflation. I think we have gone through those causes. Government budget deficits, Increase in money supply, export surplus, the outbreak of war, uh, general increase in wage rates, and C, or rather B2, causes of cost push inflation. We have wage increases, increase in indirect taxes, increase in input prices, increase in interest rates, currency devaluation. And then C, we are required to state four problems faced by commercial banks in Cameroon. So what are the problems that commercial banks face in Cameroon? Here you are required to state, not explain. First, we have the inability of customers to provide suitable collaterals. So, most Cameroonians may want to get loans from banks, but of course, uh, one of the conditions for obtaining a long-term loan is that you must have a suitable collateral. And so most Cameroonians don't have these collaterals, so the banks don't give out the loans. Remember, banks want to give out loans because uh, the interest that they earn on the loan enables them to make profit. Remember, a collateral is any asset that a customer will give as a guarantee that if there is a default of payment of the loan, then the asset will be sold to recover the loan. But equally, uh, the income levels in Cameroon is uh, rather low. So there's low income level of Cameroonians. And because the income level is low, most of the money that they earn is spent on consumption and very little amount left for uh, for for saving. Next, we have lack of confidence in banks. 
lack of confidence in banks. So a good number of Cameroonians only have confidence in banks, perhaps uh, because they prefer informal financial institutions like uh, Ninja Savings, Junja, and uh, credit unions. So that competition that banks face from credit unions and informal financial institutions tends to be a major problem that they face in Cameroon. And then we have insufficient managerial and technical expertise. Of course, we have very good managers in Cameroon, but uh, it's not really the, the, the number not really sufficient to meet uh, the demand. I know Cameroon being uh, a developing country, the training institutions in Cameroon are currently being uh, booming up. But for now, we really don't have expert managers to man the banking system. And uh, finally, we have political instability. Banks complain that because of the instability uh, political instability in the country, their customers are unable to repay their loans. So there is high loan uh, delinquency because of uh, political instability. Exercise 12. Define the following terms. Demand for money, retail price index, overdraft. D. Explain four limitations on commercial banks' ability to create credits. And C. Say that and explain four differences between a commercial bank and a central bank. So for the definitions, first we have the demand for money. Give the definition simple, the desire to hold part of one's wealth in liquid cash and not in any other form. Two, retail price index. We did say it's an average price, which is calculated to show how the value of money has changed over time. And three, overdraft. An overdraft is a loan that is given out by allowing a current account holder to overdraw his current account. In other words, it is when a bank allows a customer to withdraw more than the outstanding balance in his current account. Uh, commercial banks do want to give out loans because it is the most profitable of their activity. But there are limitations of giving out these loans. So we call these limitations of credit creation. So these limitations will include first, high required reserve ratio. The required reserve ratio is also known as cash ratio. If the cash ratio is high, then it means that the bank multiplier will be low. And when bank multiplier is low, then it limits the ability of banks to create credit. We also have tight or contractionary monetary policy. When the government institutes a contractual monetary policy, it means that those policies are aimed at reducing the supply of money. And when the supply of money reduces, interest rate will high, and that will discourage people from borrowing. So that limits credit creation. And then cash drain from the economy. When there is cash drain from the economy, possibly due to a balance of payment deficit, the credit creation will reduce since the supply of money in the economy will be low and interest rate will be high. Then the need for collateral security is also a significant factor that will reduce or limit credit creation. So banks will not give out loans unless there is a guarantee that the loan will be repaid. And to ensure that loans are repaid, they ask for a collateral. And since most customers may not have collaterals, the ability of banks to give out loans will be limited. So that limits credit creation. And they will have high liquidity preference. If liquidity preference is high, if the desire to hold wealth only in liquid cash is high, then it means that banks will not even have uh, uh, money to give out as loans, since people will not save their money in banks. And finally, lack of confidence in the banking system. When people don't have confidence in the banking system, then they will simply not deal with banks. And when they don't deal with banks, then the banks will not, not be able to give out loans, and so credit creation is limited. Then finally, you will ask you the differences between a commercial bank and the central bank, remember, uh, in terms of numbers, there are many commercial banks in the country, but only one central bank. In terms of accepting deposits, commercial banks, they accept deposits from members of the general public, but central banks accept deposits from uh, commercial banks only. Uh, in terms of ownership, the central bank is owned by the government. It's a government bank. 
the commercial banks are owned by private individuals or shareholders. And in terms of objective, the central bank's objective is to control the supply of money in the economy, thereby achieving the economic policy objectives whose overall aim is to improve standard of living. But commercial banks are aimed at making profit. So by definition, commercial banks are profit-making institutions. So the objective is profit-making. And then notes and coins issue for the central bank, the, the, the central banks have the responsibility of issuing bank notes. So they print bank notes, they mint coins. That responsibility is for the central bank, not commercial banks. So central, commercial bank cannot issue bank notes, cannot uh, print bank notes, cannot mint coins, while commercial bank, or while central, sorry, while uh, the central bank has that responsibility of doing that. And then in terms of uh, lending, the central bank lends only to members of the, or the, the central bank lends only to commercial banks. So they are giving loans, give out loans to the commercial banks. The commercial banks, they give out loans uh, to any member of the general public. Okay, uh, if there are questions, I will take them. Any question? Yes, Shelly, any question? Share your, please, sorry. You share your own. No, sir. No question. Okay. Any other person? Can we go ahead? Okay, we can now move on to the next phase of our revision project. Uh, here we have uh, public finance. Remember, public finance is the income and expenditure of the entire public sector. And the sources of public finance or the public or the sources of uh, Government revenue, we have taxes, borrowing, social insurance contributions, and so on. Uh, categories of government expenditures. Uh, categories of government expenditures, please. We have capital expenditure, recurring expenditure, uh, debt servicing expenditure, and so on. Uh, the reasons for imposing taxes, government impose taxes to raise revenue, to redistribute income, to allocate, to reallocate resources for stabilization of the economy, and so on. Remember, the budget is a financial statement of planned income and expenditure for a period of time, usually one year. Uh, Our next revision lesson will be national economy and external trade. Una tege si matege yop, una tege minga matege nyum, una tege majang matege ndom, mane tambia niña ne injubia yen, ngani bana matege mot, ngani la kiri watege ndong, esa tina bia dinkido, mane tambia niña ne injubia yen, tam tama mote tam zabike. Tam tam a tonge tam zabike tam 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 a mote tam zabike mane tam bia niña ne injo bia yen 